All right, so for this one, we're gonna be mostly talking about uh, MacArthur right before uh, World War II, basically. So this is from 1935 to 1941 um, era. And basically it's kind of the end of his time as chief of staff, um, basically right up to when he goes to the Philippines, right? Um, so to take a quote, this is him as chief of staff, right? So he, this was at a time where like he was kind of considering like starting law, like going to law school after being after his uh, time as chief of staff. But basically um, stuff that was happening in the Far East was a lot more compelling for him, which isn't surprising considering his past. Considering that basically in total he spent uh, 50, I think 50 or 60 of his uh, years um, literally in the Far East, whether it was the Philippines or Japan or somewhere in there. But anyways, dig quote. So the year before he stepped down from chief of staff, uh, the Japanese completed their conquest of Manchuria and Congress passed the Tidings McDuffie Act, granting the Philippines Commonwealth status as a prelude to complete independence, which would come in 1946, basically right after at the end of World War II. Um, so from there, uh, at the time, so FDR hadn't decided to extend MacArthur's term as chief of staff, but the president agreed that once the general had left the War Department, he would sail for Luzon as Quezon requested. Uh, Quezon being the um, president, prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Philippines at the time, right? Um, someone that MacArthur knew pretty well, we'll say. Uh, to take a direct quote from MacArthur, one thing that MacArthur said to uh, Cusan on June 1st, um, he said he re basically Cusan had like was offering him the uh, the high commissioner position um, in the Philippine Commonwealth, um, and so basically he said, I realize fully the high glamour and potential political possibilities in the high office of high commissioner as compared with the relative obscurity of a professional military position. But in this instance, there is nothing that could tempt me from our agreement. If I am approached upon the matter, which I do not anticipate, I will not commit myself until after conferring with you. So this was kind of, like the author says, it's devious of MacArthur to say the least because he was actually actively canvassing for that position regardless there was um this was when basically there was a uh, because let me gather my thoughts first so macarthur was active duty right um military and so there was some provisions that wouldn't allow him to have like a political position like high commissioner so he was basically the um and said he would have to be the uh military advisor version which is kind of what he's referring to uh, so there's that um and we'll get to more specifics now so the day after labor day he dined alone i mean he being a uh, macarthur again he dined alone with roosevelt at hyde park and was wow if i could talk was rewarded with a presidential promise to name him as high commissioner um, so then a snag developed. Under the law, he could not be nominated until he had resigned from the army. On September 9th, he wrote Roosevelt that he was somewhat dismayed and nonplussed by this and suggested that another piece of special legislation could remove that obstacle. The president was contemplating that when word of MacArthur's def uh, defamation campaign against Mur or reached Murphy, uh, who protested to the White House. Throwing up his hands, FDR decided to leave things as they were. Murphy would become high commissioner and MacArthur Cuzon's military advisor. Basically like the whole active canvassing that MacArthur was doing kind of uh, shot him in the back, we'll say. Still have to keep things somewhat, uh, I don't wanna say PC, but I guess tame for YouTube. Um, per my usual language. Uh, and on top of this, it kind of worked out a bit because Pinky, who was uh, MacArthur's mom, was severely ill at the time. She was 84 too. And so MacArthur refused to leave her. 
and basically brought her to Manila, more or less. Um, that. So, kind of fast forward, forwarding a little bit since uh, MacArthur is in Manila um, as the military advisor to Kazan. Basically, they had this elaborate ceremony at Malacanen Palace. I'm going to say it's how I pronounce it. Um, on August 24th, uh, 1936, uh, Ora Kuzan, the Commonwealth's first lady, presented him with a gold baton. He was now a, a field marshal. And basically, um, MacArthur was pretty much the only one who uh, got this, um, we'll say, honor um, for the U.S. Army. And an interesting thing, too, because at the time... Uh, Eisenhower, who was a lieutenant colonel at the time, was uh, MacArthur's aide. And basically, there was, um, I'm also going through the biography of Eisenhower as of right now. So, we talked a bit about how, like, he strongly kind of dissuaded, tried to dissuade MacArthur from taking this because of political reasonings. Um, but pretty much, MacArthur ended up ignoring him at the end, which is kind of par for the course with his personality. Um, but this is something that kind of, it plays, I don't wanna say it has a big play later on of him being field marshal, um, but at least with the Filipinos, uh, Philippine people, it, it did. Um, not on kind of like the actual World War II slash allies side of things though. Um, let's see, one other thing that's important to note in this part of his life is how he, he got a son, right? He had a kid um, and how that kind of changed him. So he had a son, Arthur, and it pretty much more, more or less like complete, not completely, but like significantly changed how coarse he was to the people he worked with, it seemed. Um, so to take a quote, this is how pretty much every morning went. So at 7.30 a.m., the door of the general's bedroom would open and the boy would trudge in clutching his favorite toy, a stuffed rabbit with a scraggly mustache, which he called Old Friend. MacArthur would instantly bound out of bed and snap to attention. Then the general marched around the room in quick step while his son counted cadence, boom, boom, boobity, boom. Uh, after they had passed the bed several times, the child would cover his eyes with his hands while MacArthur produced that day's present. A piece of candy, perhaps, or a crayon, or a coloring book. The ritual would end in the bathroom, where MacArthur would shave while Arthur watched the watched and both sang duets, Sweet Rosie O'Grady, well, Rosie O'Grady, I mean, a Roman in the gloom, uh, gloaming, uh, burring all the R's or Army Blue. So it's kind of like someone who is always known to be like very, I don't, not necessarily, well, with MacArthur probably would be adequate to say uptight, but very coarse, especially to the people around him, um, more or less in terms of what the orders and stuff that he would give. Um, he was known for being very uh, charismatic, we'll say and always like having, knowing how to get what he wanted out of people, we'll say. Um, but his son in and of itself like thoroughly changed how coarse he was in general. And then book goes into a lot of, has some baby pictures of Arthur and so on. There's a lot of pictures in this book. They're all black and white, but I mean, he was born in 1880, so at least there's pictures. Um, that being said, some, I guess, logistics for the stuff too, is um, the book that we're going through is American Caesar, Douglas MacArthur, 1880 to 1964 by William Manchester. So here's the cover of mine, right? So you guys can see it. Uh, with that being said, this isn't the only source I plan on going through. Um, just, just kind of the first one, get the general outline for I guess the gist of MacArthur's life in general from 1880 to 1951. Wow, 1964, even though I just said it. Um, I think 1951 was because that was when he was recalled and stuff from Korea. Anyways, um, we'll get into that later, right? 
Um, so with that being said, if there's anything specific in this playlist um, of all the videos and stuff that you guys want me to go into more depth, just let me know in the comments and stuff below. Um, as per usual, I will put the, the next video in the, the actual, the playlist will be up in the top right corner as I tend to always do, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about this kind of time period. Obviously I'm not doing like very, uh, going into very minute detail throughout his whole thing. Um, because that would, it's like an 800 something page book. Um. Yeah, once you get into the notes, it's in the 780s and such. So it's lengthy and a lot of stuff into it, but that's what there is. Anyways, I'm gonna leave this one here. So with that, I will see you guys on the next one where we get into the beginning of World War II, so.